mitzvah. And if they'd gone the other, then possibly, I mean, the Lord could always work it out some other way, but uh, Helen's family would not have heard the gospel if a decision had been made in that direction instead of that direction. So the title of my talk today is that is God's way, not by chance, not by luck, but by divine design. He changed and directed things. So I might start with a scripture though. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 3. And one of the things that um, many of us can relate to is that we got to a point of curiosity where we wanted to hear and really wanted to see what somebody had spoken to us about. Now, this is the story of uh, Moses and the burning bush. And you talk about God, you know, often people say, you set me up. Well, we could say that to God, you set us up, which he did, so that we would hear the gospel. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. Now, we know the story very well. But I dare say the thought was that he put something there and Moses could have ignored it and just gone on. You know, when we think of the scripture where Jesus said, many are called and few are chosen, there must literally be thousands and millions of people that get the call that never get any further than that. And this, the, the parable of the sower and the seed, the first part of that parable is that the seed fell on stony ground it never never did anything it was consumed by the birds it never germinated nothing grew at all and unfortunately that's the vast majority but on this occasion it wasn't a failure God created the burning bush but it was up to Moses to be directed in that direction with every talking about our own testimony with every one of us there's a bit of a different story there so I'm going to just start going through, I'll look at some more scriptures in a minute. I'm going to start going through Helen's testimony. Um, and then maybe if, if this talk works, I might be invited back in a fortnight to go through my testimony. <laughs> so anyhow, I've jotted down a few prompts here on Helen's testimony. And it is partly the, um, I dare say, the uh, foundation of this fellowship here in Geelong. So Helen's father's name was Neil McConaughey. Neil Duncan McConaughey, actually. And um, his father, Daniel Brown McConaughey, back in Glasgow, was a gambler. And the family lost everything. And he ended up dying in the uh, Glasgow poorhouse. And, uh, and Helen's father, Mac, just as quite a young boy, had to go to work and uh, to try and help the family survive. And, uh, but anyhow, when he was 17 years old, after working on a number of farms in, in Scotland, he decided to immigrate. And this is maybe one of the times that I'm referring to. He actually to tossed a penny. He tossed a penny. And heads this, tails that. And the choice was between Canada and Australia. He had relatives in both places. And uh, so I believe, guided by the Lord... Not, not advising anybody to do this, by the way, but uh, this is what he did. He wasn't in the Lord, and it came down heads, I dare say, for Australia. And he found out about a scheme that uh, the, the Premier of South Australia, a guy called Premier um, uh, Barwell, formed a scheme to bring uh, boys from, uh, particularly orphan boys, from Glasgow and London and places like that, to Australia in 1922 to replace the boys from Australia that went to the First World War and never came back. So they were farm boys. It was called the Barrel Boy Scheme. 14,000 applied and only 10% were accepted. Uh, only 1,400 accepted. So even there, I, I believe, you can see the Lord's hand that only 
one out of ten, and he Mac got chosen. And um, he then arrived in a South Australia on a ship in 1922, 100 years ago, Helen said, from this month exactly. In 1922, he arrived in Australia. And um, he then does farming in that room. I won't go through all of that. And he meets his future wife, Helen's mum, um, Louisa May uh, Ferguson. But she's only a kid and he has to wait a while for her to grow up. And it wasn't until he was uh, 30 and she was 20 that uh, 13 years later from arriving here that he married her. Um, they got a farm granted to them from the uh, Australian government. Uh, by the way, Sejuna, for those who don't know, is a really desolate place. It's right on the edge of the outback and near the, the dog fence is just, just there. So the 10 inch rain, rainfall is only a little bit and hardly ever get that. I'm sure they did this year. But um, anyhow, he had the farm and I won't go through all that. In 1938, uh, three years later with uh, one little child, Helen's sister uh, Janet, they, they left in a Model T Ford and drove towards Adelaide from Sejuna. And when they got to the turn off between either going right down to Port Lincoln or left up to Port Augusta through to Adelaide, guess what, he tossed another coin. So he was sort of looking for some sort of direction. And again, who knows what would have happened if the family had gone down to Port Lincoln. But no, it was to go through to Adelaide. And they then um, lived on a farm in the Adelaide Hills, a chicken farm, uh, a place called a Chunga. And they got burnt out by a bushfire. The whole thing got wrecked. And so they continued to travel east and they ended up in Melbourne. Um, and there for a while there, Mac went off to the war, by the way, in the Second World War in the uh, RAAF up in Darwin after it got bombed and so on. And then um, let's just move into about 1952 in Melbourne. And um, what actually happened there is Mac got a job as a bus driver, but he always suffered badly with asthma. And uh, the pollution in uh, Melbourne was really literally killing him. And uh, the doctor said to him, unless you get out of Melbourne, you'll die. Now, it happened to be on June the 20th, 1952, there was a major flood in a river called the Barwon River. And um, the whole town, actually, the, the levee bank broke and literally Barwon Heads was flooded, the town was. And uh, they, Hel uh, Helen was only a little kid at the time of six, and uh, Janet was 10 years older, so she would have been 16, Lorraine 13. And mum and dad were standing around the table in Melbourne and looking at this um, uh, situation, they said, well, one place we won't go is to Barwon Heads. Guess what? Ten months later, they bought a little farm in Barwon Heads. As I said, I believe all these things are of the Lord, the Lord directing our path where we often don't want to go, and he guides us. And they ended up buying a farm on Ling's Road um, near the 13th Golf Course. In actual fact, Helen's old farm, 104 acres, uh, is now part of the 13th Golf Course. Uh, and there was a farm right around, which was also mainly taken up by the 13th Golf Course, owned by a family called the Lings, and particularly a lady called Pat Ling. And uh, they came to the Lord here uh, in Geelong in around early 1955. What actually happened is that a lot of people know a little bit of this history, that in the end of 1949, uh, Jack Clay, who was one of the early pastors here in Geelong, got, got converted through Lloyd Longfield witnessing to him. They were old fr family friends. And they started a little revival here in Geelong. And in 1952, uh, Noel Hollands, who was from Melbourne and gone to Ballarat, moved down to Geelong and the two men, Jack and, and Noel, formed an incredibly good team for about 20 years. And there was great revival in this area. But jumping back earlier, so from 1952 onwards, the work then started to grow, particularly here in Geelong. And uh, in 1955, they were meeting in Aberdeen House. I, I understand it's not there anymore, in Aberdeen Street. And they had to do some renovations, so they decided to have some campaigns out in the Barwon Heads region and district, Connawarri Hall and all that sort of thing. And through that, so again, I think of the Lord directing that. 
It's all very comfortable here in Aberdeen House, but I've got a job for you to do. And they, they went out and preached the gospel down in Barwon Heads and region, and there was quite a revival. And uh, this lady, Pat Ling, got converted in the early 1955. And uh, she witnessed to, somebody might remember, uh, Jock and, I like that name, Jock and Trudy Napier. So actually Pat Ling witnessed to her. But later that year, so we'll get on with the McConaughey family, um, later that same year, Mac, who was, had a little 100 acres surrounded by the Ling's farm, we were quite wealthy, he went down to Pat Ling, or to get down to the Ling's, just down the end of the road. Um, but actually I have jumped ahead of an incident that happened only a few weeks before this, that Mac went to the front door and he saw this very tall six foot six man who was looking to find the local house meeting, which was the Lings at the end of the road. And he came back and he said, I've just seen the tallest Bible basher I've ever met. I wonder who that was. So anyhow, um, uh, uh, later that year, we see that um, he went down to borrow a plough and a, a horse, a little plough and a horse to pull it. And while he was there, Pat Ling said to him, um, I've received the Holy Spirit and I speak in tongues and I've been healed of my asthma and we're having a meeting here Thursday night or whatever it was and would you like to come? And Max said, No. But when he got home, he said, I'll send the girls. So he went back and he told Janet, Helen's older sister and younger si next sister down the road, the Lings have got religion, they're having a meeting on Thursday night and I said that you would go. So they went, Janet went down there. Janet back in Melbourne uh, had uh, been trying to uh, bring kids in from the migrant hostels and um, but they, she found out that the Methodist church s snubbed them because they were foreigners or whatever they were. And uh, she got disillusioned with the church. And only a short time before she went to this meeting at the Ling's house down the end of their road, um, she, Janet, uh, Lorraine came in and heard Janet saying, basically, God, where are, where are you? I can't find you. And uh, so that obviously was of the Lord. And that night, the two girls went to the meeting down the end of the road. And it was actually Jack Clay that was running the meeting. And he would start in Genesis and go through to Revelation. Um, and Janet was just, re again, it was the right moment for Janet. The Lord sort of sets us up for the best moment we can to hear the gospel. And we just see there that on that night, uh, she believed it. She had her hands in bandages because she had very bad eczema and she suffered from, with chalk in those days as a school teacher. And um, she had partial deafness in one ear and upshot was that that night they saw the bandits and they prayed for her and over the next couple of weeks she got totally healed and she came to the Lord. So that was the end of 1955 and uh, being a school teacher in uh, December, uh, late December, January, she was on school holidays and uh, the, the uh, McConaughey family, uh, Helen's maiden name was McConaughey, um, they uh, didn't have electricity, didn't even have a whatever that other electricity you have on a farm. Um, yeah, no, that's another name. It is like a generator. I won't go through it. So anyhow, it's way that farmers generated electricity. Um, and um, remember it was 32 volt, funny. Remember that? 32 volt. So um, I lost myself there, didn't I? Um, where did I get to? Um, sorry? Christmas. Uh, I better go back to my notes. Uh, Serena, I said all that, said all that, said all that. Go over the page. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll look at another scripture, seeing as I've lost my way. Okay, I want to go through the fascinating story of the election of the 12th Apostle in Acts chapter 1, because it's an unusual story. And some people, I don't, but some people even doubt the authenticity of it, of uh, maybe it was done the wrong way, the election of the 12th apostle. 
I don't go with that. I believe it was very much of the Lord. Some people said they should have relied on the Holy Spirit. But guess what? They didn't have the Holy Spirit. A couple of days later they did. But at this point they didn't have the Holy Spirit. And it was between the crucifixion and the day of Pentecost. So in Acts chapter 1, we know that Peter and the others have gone through a lot of turmoil. Even Peter went back fishing for a while. And the Lord said, no, I've called you to feed my sheep. And we know that great story. So finally they've settled down and the Lord said, you're going to have to wait in Jerusalem until you've been endured from on high. Don't go out anywhere, just sit here. Maybe they didn't even know how long that would be, but just sit here. So while they're sitting there, I can only assume, it's always dangerous to assume, you can only assume that the Lord said to Peter, we've got to replace Judas and... Um, we can't have 11 apostles. We want a foundation of 12 apostles, 12 patriarchs from the Old Testament, 12 apostles from the New Testament. So we'll pick it up in verse 15 of Acts chapter 1. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together being about 120, men and brethren, this scripture must needs be fulfilled. Now, I don't know how he knew about these scriptures. Was there some particular revelation from the Lord because when you read the scriptures they're in two separate parts of the book of Psalms they're not even in the same psalm so actually puts two separate scriptures together and explains what they mean which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David halfway through verse 16 spake concerning Judas which was guide to them that took Jesus and he was numbered with us um got the word numbered and that a big thing in Bible is numbers. And we know that number 12 represents like government, some sort of authority, and 12 is very much 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament, later on 12 apostles. And when Jesus got to 12 initially, three and a half years before, he never appointed another one. And it wasn't until Judas fell from grace, it went back to 11, and he said, no, we've got to go back to 12. Um, he was numbered with us, obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased the field with a reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst. It's a lovely scripture, this very descriptive. And all his bowels gushed out. We won't go into that. By the way, a lot of people say, is there some contradiction here? Because the Bible says he went and hanged himself. Well, often when sort of uh, murderers and criminals and people like that, when they were executed, there was a valley and they just grab the body and they throw the body into the valley. And then this happened, what it says here. Um, and it was known unto all the dwellers in Jerusalem, inasmuch as that the field is called in their proper tongue a saldama, that is to say, the field of blood. So now he quotes the scriptures of importance here. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, one, one part of the book of Psalms, and let no man dwell therein, and then his bishopric let another take. Now, I haven't got the reference. You might have them in your margin. If you've got them, two different psalms that that comes from. So he says, right, he has um, uh, done what he's done. He's gone. Now we need to, basically, we need to replace him. And then he says, wherefore of these men, which have, we would say, accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out of among us, so what he does here, again, I gather, led by the Lord, is he wants, if you've got a foundation, I'm sure there's builders in our midst here, the worst thing you can do with a foundation is pour some of it and then try to add something to it later on. Like if you have a, a, a platform underneath a house, a slab, you do it all at once. You put all the metal out with our modern foundations, put all the Forticom, all the plastic underneath and so on, and then you do it in one big pour. But if you run out of concrete and you've got a bit to do, then try to tack it on at the end. It's a fault. It's a fault in that foundation. So what Peter's really saying here is whoever the twelfth man is, he's got to be equal to the other eleven. He mustn't be any different. And uh, so he sets a few guidelines. I'll start again in verse 21. Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that 
same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness of us of his resurrection. Here's an amazing thing. 120 of them, now maybe 50% were ladies. I don't know. Regardless of what we think about that, the choice was not going to be a lady. We won't go into that tonight. Just one's going to be. It's going to be another man. So out of all that, say 60 odd people, um, men, maybe 70 men, we don't know the, the breakup, there was only two. There was only two that had survived from the very beginning of John the Baptist's ministry until that time and had stuck with them. There could have been none. There could have been ten. There could have been more than two. But there ended up being just two. If there had only been one, it would have already been decided. We've only got one. He's obviously the twelfth apostle. And maybe it's good that it wasn't like that because God needed to have a hand in the whole thing. And... um, so he goes right back, went through all the 120 people and they just came up with two guys that st- started at the same time that the other 11 apostles had been appointed in those first few weeks of the ministry of Jesus and they came up with these two guys, um, uh, Justus and M- uh, Matthias. So it says in verse 23, and they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justus, and Matthias. And they said... And they prayed. Now, don't forget this. They prayed. They are looking for guidance. We want you to have a say in this God. I mean, some might have said, oh, I like justice. I don't, and the other, I don't particularly like justice. I like Matthias. You can see where that would have gone. Would have been the choice of people. Would have been a fleshly choice. At this point, they're not chosen because anybody liked or disliked them. They were the only ones that had the criteria that they were equal to the other, in every way to the other 11. So, um, so then we see they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. God, we need your hand in this situation. Now, the casting of lots was often used in the Old Testament. And that's why a little bit some people question it. But we are still, only a few days to go, we are still under the Old Testament system. The the Holy Spirit hasn't yet come down. We can't be led of the Spirit if we haven't got the Spirit. So they're using a system where they're saying, let's do it this way and let God choose the way. Um, Verse 25, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression transgression fell that he might go to his own place and then verse 26 says and they gave forth their lots now the basic way that they did that is they'd get something like a bit of wood and they would write on one justice on another one Matthias there'll be a little lot like that then usually somebody would sit down and in those days the men wore long garments they went down to the ground and in their lap they would throw the lots and they would not watch what they're doing. They just throw the lots. There could have been more than two, but on this case, just two. Throw the lots like that. And then the prayer was, Lord, you make sure I pick out the right one without looking. So there was no influence of the flesh or like or dislike. So that's what they did. They put the two names on two bits of wood, threw it in the lap, and then I guess, I guess it was the Apostle Peter reached in without looking, picked up one, and believing that God had answered their prayer, you guide my hand, and Matthias was chosen. I always feel a bit sorry for Ju- Judas or Justice. He got that close. I hope he went on with it. I hope he didn't go into a tailspin. That close, and I missed out. I don't know. So they gave forth their loss, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, now and again, I've heard some people say, oh, I don't think that was legal. And well, I believe that the apostle Paul became the, the 12th apostle. Well, actually, the, I don't believe there's any scripture to support that. And just one verse there, have a look at it in Acts chapter 6 and verse 2. You'll see that Matthias is included in the 12. And again, going back to my thought on equ- equality, even though Paul, of course, was a fantastic guy, he, didn't have the, he wasn't equal to the other 11, whereas Matthias was. But in Acts chapter 6, verse 2, when they had that dispute over, over the table serving, it says, Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them. By the way, uh, 
Paul wasn't yet to be converted, chapter 9. So he's not even converted at this point and it very much refers to that. So I believe it was of the Lord and guiding his hand. And I get, maybe going back to our little story of Helen, let's go back to that. Um, or let me go back to that. So we got to the point where they're at a house meeting at um, Pat Ling's place and Janet and Lorraine have gone there. And then uh, after that, uh, towards the end of 1955, Janet comes to the Lord. And I mean, oh, sorry, I was talking about electricity. That's why I got sidetracked. They didn't have electricity in the house. It had been invented, but they didn't have it. And um, the, all they had was a pump-up petrol life on a on a Arnott's biscuit tin in the middle of the kitchen table. And uh, uh, Janet, now converted, preached over school holidays, 56, 55, 56 school holidays, about the things of the Lord, how she'd come to the Lord, how she'd be miraculously healed from her eczema and from her hearing and baptised and filled with the Holy Spirit. And Helen particularly remembers sitting around the table and reading the Bible and so on. So over the next month, particularly January uh, 1956, a lot of people were coming to the Lord. There was a Connewari Hall. If it's still there, but it's somebody's house these days. And that hall there, they had quite a lot of meetings in there. A lot of the local farmers here in, in Geelong would come in with uh, the hot water in a, in a um, milk container. Remember the old with the lid on the top, quite big, and bring, bring the, uh, the hot water in and fill the, fill the tank and so on. Uh, the, the, they just had hanging lights there too, I think, burning lights. So again, the night that, Jan uh, that Helen was baptised, which was the 14th of January 1956, 10 people got baptised. And um, so, as I said, there was quite a great uh, revival in this, in this particular part of the woods. So what happened then, Mac was the lo took the longest to come. Janet, her mum, uh, Louisa and uh, Lorraine and Helen all now converted. But Mac, being a con canny old Scot, was very wary. He wanted to see whether this was a flash in the pan sort of thing, so he hung back. But the thing that, amazing enough, that really converted him was what we call the British Israel message. And uh, he looked at that, the natural side of it, and the thought of the descendant of King David and all that, and that is what caught his attention. And in the end, in his simplicity, he just said, that makes sense. And the end result, he got baptised and spirit-filled uh, somewhere there in 19... Nearly mid 15, 1956. He then went back to Sojuna, where he'd landed as a kid at 17, had a farm, all that, got starved. He went back there to witness to his wife's family, big family, a lot of, she had a lot of sisters and brothers, eight, something like that, a uh, Ferguson family. And um, he didn't know much, because even in, in those days, he was a, still a dairy farmer. And he had to milk cows on Sunday afternoon, so hardly ever got to a communion meeting. Um, so he didn't really know a lot. And the rallies were firing questions at him. And he said, look, I don't really know the answer. I'm going to go home. I'm going to work out, because he used to be a wharfie as well as run the farm. He said, I'll work out and I'll pay. He called his wife Mickey. I'll pay for Mickey and Janet to come back around Christmas time, 56, 57, and they'll tell you. And that's exactly what happened. And Janet and her mum, who's very shy, Mrs Mack was a very shy lady, uh, my, my mother-in-law as well, she, um, the two ladies, I won't go through it all, and when they got to Sejuna after trying to witness the other rallies who didn't like what they heard, um, Mrs. Mack, um, now how am I going for time? I'm nearly out, aren't I? Mrs. Mack, um, her sister, Auntie Bob, we called her, had had polio. In actual fact, the two women slept in the same bed as kids, and Auntie Bob got polio, and Helen's mum didn't. But she had, she had a withered arm. And uh, she asked um, her sister, Mrs. Mack, as we called her, Louisa, to perm her hair, because she couldn't do it. And while that happened, she witnessed to her. And she came to the Lord and then Janet witnessed to one of her children called John Borden, one of Helen's cousins, and he came to the Lord. We'll just say that. They then went back to Geelong. And there's two people now, 
By the way, the, the Holy Ghost revival was very thin on the ground in Australia, very thin. There was only about two or three um, groups. Uh, there was one I mentioned, our own fellowship, but there was AOG, Apostolic, there wasn't much else, CRC, and so on. There was just those few. And on the west coast of this South Australia, there was almost nobody. And um, so she went back in 9 through 1957, back here in Geelong, she talked to a couple of people called Len and Joan Day. And they were converted here in, in Geelong. And um, jo uh, Len was a daredevil sort of a guy. Uh, he had been uh, nearly, by the way, nearly all the oversight, most of them were. Uh, returned servicemen. Jack Clay was, Lloyd Longfield was. They're all guys that have been to war. And the two we had in Adelaide uh, later on, Len Day and Peter Mullen, his brother on it, were both returned servicemen. That was very common in those days. And now Len had been up in the islands and he came back to Geelong and he and a couple, two of his mates got into making their own speedboats. And uh, down here in the bay they raced them. They got sick of that. They decided to build cars themselves and being petrol heads, they went to the Bathurst race one day in uh, around 1950, maybe 1955. And uh, I won't go through all that again, but he had not designed his car very well and it really had the shape of a wing of an aeroplane. So he was roaring around the Blue Mountain somewhere and as he came around the side of a hill it, with the updraft, it lifted the car up. And the front wheels came off the ground and he crashed at high speed. He had a lot of injuries. I remember one leg got broken in eight places. And uh, he recovered over quite a few months from all that injury, but he damaged the balance nerve in his, in his head, in, near his ear. And every now and again, he couldn't control it. He would just fall over. Now, if, uh, some Geelong people know that down the main street of Moorable Street, there's Lynn Day... Uh, car radio so I think the sign stood up on one of the walls and um, so one day Jack Clay uh, went in and uh, took a car radio in to get fixed and while he was there Len Day fell over so Jack leapt over the counter picked him up and put him on a chair and like any sick person sort of poured out all his problems and after a while Jack just said to him look I think I know somebody that can heal you and Len said, no, I've been to the best specialists, uh, Spencer Street specialists, and nobody can help me. And every now and again, Jack would say, I think I know somebody that can heal you. And then eventually, in frustration, Len said, who's that? And then um, he finally, Jack said, oh, his name's Jesus Christ. And Len, oh, no, not any, I'm not interested in that at all. So a couple of weeks later or so on, Jack came back to collect his car radio, which had been fixed. And by that time, Len's thinking, this is guy's religious. Be careful what you say. And, of course, of course, Jack said to him, how are you feeling, Len? And Jack said, uh, Len said, I've never felt better in my life. And with that, he fell over again. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, Jack picked him up and said, look, what have you got to lose? I'm running a little meeting out in the country here somewhere towards Colac or somewhere. And he said, why don't you come along? He, he said the old same thing. What have you got to lose? You said nobody can help you. So he went. And I uh, just say that he, when he got there, he was not sure he'd done the right thing. He actually said to his wife, Joan, and asked her to come with him. And she said, no, you've done everything else. You've been into boats. You've been into cars. You might as well go religious. I'm not interested. And uh, he went with the apprentice, actually. I don't know if the apprentice ever got saved. But when he got to the hall, the country hall, he opened the back door and looked in and he nearly closed. Oh, it's not really me. And Jack saw him and waved. So he came in and he was using a thing called an uh, epidioscope, which is like a projector. But uh, with a projector, the, the light goes through the, the slide and it's very bright. But with an epidioscope, it reflects up onto the wall. It was quite hard to see. Now, what has that got to do with anything? It got the fact that Len started off on the back row and ended up on the front row so he could read it. And then right at the end, Jack gave an altar call and Len's hand went up when he asked, looked around thinking every hand in the hall was up and his was the only one. Pulled it down and Jack said, I saw that hand. So he then came to the Lord, baptised and spirit-filled, and talk about miracle of miracles, he got healed enough of that hearing, uh, that inner ear thing to get a pilot's licence. You've got to be A1 to get a pilot's licence. So that was a great miracle. So this is the guy that Janet Coleman started telling about her couple of relatives on the East Coast 
uh, of South Australia, west coast of South Australia that had come to the Lord. And then they, um, so Len suddenly, he was a daredevil sort of a guy, he just said to Janet, why don't we go there and have an outreach? So they drove a thousand dirt road from Port Augusta to Sejuna. They drove across. They, on the 29th of, uh, of December, 1957, 58 Christmas, on that day, a year later from when John, Janet and, Laura, and Mrs Mack had been there, he ran a meeting. Now, how long, how long have I got? Another five minutes? Five. Give me five. So, um, so I'll just... Try and bring it down to five minutes. Um, so what have I got here? Right, on, on the 29th of December, 1957, there was a campaign in the RSL Hall in Sejuna. Now, Pastor John Coleman was a Methodist, and he was a friendly with John Borden, who had been already converted and knocked him back. But on, on we'll just jump to that day, the 29th of December, Sunday... Uh, and um, he was running, he was a Methodist lay preacher, and he was running a, a little meeting out in a town called Mudamukla near Sejuna. And um, after the meeting, like they do, they stand outside and talk about the weather and the crops and all that. On this occasion, there's a, a guy there called Keith Mapperson, who was ex apostolic and got converted back in Adelaide. Uh, but he now, I won't go through all that was there. And he said to John Coleman, he said, are you going to the revival meeting tonight? And John didn't even know it was on. So this is in line of what my talk is tonight, how the Lord sets us up. So uh, John said, no, I don't even know about it. So he said, no, I'm not going to go. And then he had a farm labourer who he'd brought to the meeting off the, off the Coleman farm. And the, and the farm labourer said, I want to go to that meeting. So John Coleman said, all right. Will go on the understanding that you go to your church, which is Anglican, and I go to my church, which is Methodist, first. So Len Day wisely had started his meeting at 8 o'clock because, as you know, church goes for exactly one hour, not one minute over like I'm doing now. So um, he, they, they went and then they went to the meeting and um, um, J J uh, Len Day really wasn't a great preacher. All he did was give testimonies and that's really had more conviction than a sermon and after the meeting, um, Pastor John, or we'll just stick with John at the moment, John Coleman got talking to Len's wife, Joan Day, and he started the old thing you've heard many times, oh, you've got your beliefs and I've got my beliefs and maybe we'll just have to disagree. And Janet said to him, it doesn't matter what your beliefs are. It doesn't matter what my beliefs are. What matters is what the Bible says. And John said, how do you answer that? You know, so he agreed with that. And then this young farm labourer came bursting out of the hall and he just received the Holy Spirit. And John at the time thought, oh, I've got to get him home, he's gone mad or something, I don't know. But anyhow, it must have had an impact on John, John Coleman and he came back two days later on the 31st of January and around midnight he got down on his knees to seek for the Holy Spirit. Uh, very churchy, by the way, very churchy he was. And... Um, and, and Linda had everybody in a circle and they're down on the knees praying for the Holy Ghost. Um, and um, he came to Pastor John and he, could, he just wasn't sure what John was doing. He said to John, he said, what are you doing? Very blunt, Linda was. What, what are you doing? And, Lin, and John said, oh, I'm quoting a hymn. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. My great redeemer's... He knew it like the back of his hand. And Len said to him, you'll never receive the Holy Ghost like that. You've got to say hallelujah. You've got to pray. John said he was quite offended at the time. Len went on around the circle and he got back to, to John and John had stopped. And, and Len said, what's wrong now? And, uh, and, Len, and John said, I can't say hallelujah. Len said, oh, he's starting to get somewhere now. And by the time he got back to him, he'd been filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'll just finish off at this point because a great revival broke out in Sejuna. Quite a lot of people came to the Lord. But Len Day ended up moving down to Port Lincoln, which was um, the number one town on the west coast at that time. Sejuna's only a little place. And the revival sort of moved down there. And when I come back in two weeks' time, I'll go through what happened in particularly my situation where um, uh, the couple called Baron and Arns Kabuta got converted in that Port Lincoln revival. And um, that's it. Good night. <laughs>